My name is David Lee. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, but now I live and reside here in Houston, Texas. My formative years I spent just outside of Los Angeles. My family moved to the Valley, uh, which is about, you know, 15, 20 minutes outside of uh, K-Town. We grew up in the Valley where, you know, my, my neighbors were Hispanic, Filipino, Black, and so it was just very multicultural. And my classmates, my friends in school, very few were Korean, actually. Early on, my Korean exposure was through the church and through, you know, Korean school, which probably was not a good thing because I didn't like the time I was spending at church or Korean schools. kind of felt like it was an obligation rather than a kind of pursuing an interest. Yeah, I, I was kind of allergic to a, lo a lot of the cultural, like personal cultural journey that I've done much later in my life. I was raised in a, I wouldn't say a conser very conservative household, I would say very devoted um, household, given, you know, the how my father converted and the, the power of that incredible story. My, my parents and both of my birth sisters are very, very, very devoted to church life. To, to the gospel. And so, yeah, like I had to go to church every Wednesday doing the Wednesday services, the Sunday, the Sebyok ceremonies at like four or five in the morning. I would have to stay at church uh, or get to church super early for the morning service and then also stay super late for the afternoon service. So church was a big part of my life, whether I liked it or not. I think early on in my life, it was nice to kind of have that type of routine and that community. But I think once I started kind of questioning a lot more about my religion, my my identity, my orientation, all of that, towards like high school, it, it became pretty, uh, pretty uh, suffocating. And so I think it, it was definitely a process for me to kind of uh, do my own thing slowly uh, in, in those high school years. So growing up, um, my birth, mother, she had a lot of mental health issues. Um, she was bipolar. My two birth sisters got some of the abuse like with, with those conditions. But when both of them left the house and it was just me uh, left at home, my birth mother was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. The level in which the abuse occurred, it was much greater and much more uh, persistent, which was especially tough because I had to interact with her a lot more given that, you know, taking her to all of her medical treatments, you know, all of the different surgeries that she had to do, all the different checkups. Um, so it just created a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, trauma to occur. And so growing up uh, in middle school, I was failing, like I was doing, I wasn't doing really well in, in middle school. Before going to high school, I was like, okay, I need to get out of here. What's the best way out? And so for me, it was either being dead or, you know, school or college. And so in high school, I took school very seriously at that point. And I'm so grateful that I had that kind of light bulb moment in my head. But yeah, I, I graduated top of my class, got a full ride to Georgetown, which was the only way I, was, I would have been able to go to a school like that. I had never left Los Angeles uh, at that point. Going to college was like a, a, literally a dream come true. Um, and my my savior, <laughs> like it was like you know it, it. That's what gave me hope, right? In in those dark dark times, like that was the one thing that just kept me going. Going through that type of abuse uh, in high school and middle school, I, I was pretty determined to just the minute I can get out of that situation to never look back, right? I kind of went from one mentality where I was kind of on a rocket ship to just get the heck out of there, and then once I hit DC in college, I like just kept going and just kept um, putting my nose to the ground and just keep hustling as, as, as much as I can in order to survive. So in college, once I left LA, um, one of my best friends, um, Kelly, she would ask me, you know, when, when I'd go home for the holidays and whatnot, and I'd be like, oh, like, you know, I'm gonna run errands in DC, I'm gonna stay around. Eventually, I told her why I wasn't going home and so she she immediately was like, oh, like my family would love to have you spend the holidays with us. And I just, I still remember how like odd that was. And I was like, what, is that a thing? Like, 
if I brought her to my birth family's house for three weeks, that'd be the most awkward thing ever. And so I was like, thank you, but no thank you. And then the next day she forwarded me a $900 one-way ticket. And I was just like, holy shit. How the hell am I ever gonna pay her back? And I was like, you know what? I need to worry about that later. She already bought it. I have to go now. So came to Houston. Um, I really had no idea like her, 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 her family background, but one, you know, once I got to Houston, I was like, oh my God, like this is a whole new world I'm not used to. You know, I, I still remember her family driver picking us up from the airport and how odd that was. And she was acting so nonchalant that I ended up just kind of like matching her energy. But once I, you know, uh, spent time with her family, her family was so warm, kind, generous. And yeah, I had a great time with them. And so over the years, I would come to Houston for spring breaks, for, you know, summer breaks and whatnot, and the holidays, of course. About like six years after that point, um, while I was in graduate school, I was visiting for a weekend and uh, kind of, they all sat me down and they asked if I'd like to official, like legally be uh, officially adopted. Uh, it kind of came out of nowhere. And so I was just like, okay, can I think about this? <laughs> this is a lot. Uh, and they're like, absolutely, take as long as you need. And so, you know, I talked to my therapist about it and and all of that. And at that point, I, you know, I'd call, um, uh, I'd call my, uh, at that time, friend's mom, mom. I already considered them family. So this was just more of a, more of a kind of just like a formalizing the whole, the relationship. And so that kind of was a very interesting start to my formal adoption or, or formal adopted life. The adjustment process was incredibly difficult. Um, you know, there are a lot of people whose kind of safety I disrupted, <laughs> uh, whether it's like just their financial safety in terms of like relationships with my, my mother or like, you know, all like her immediate circle did not handle my adoption very well. And so, yeah, no, it was very tumultuous. And I think uh, it, it took uh, many, many years for it to really calm down. And it's still something that like we're still working through. Given the fact that I have so many layers to my identity, whether it's Korean American, uh, LGBT, adopted, you know, all, the, all, these, all of these layers, um, in some ways, I think has allowed my compartmentalization to like conveniently kind of just put everything away and not have to really deal with all of these different um, facets. I knew I was gay like ever since I was very young. Um, and of course, being the only son, being the uh, uh, the pastor's kid, right? And so I think that raised a lot of early kind of fear and resentment almost towards like the structure in which I was I was living and operating in. And so I think early on, I was kind of very dismissive of my heritage of um, especially these like cultural moments that are important, that are kind of relics of, um, you know, a very patriarchal society type of um, uh, history. And so I always kind of naturally pushed away from that. I feel like that probably helped me push away from my birth family. Uh, that kind of like set the scenes for me to kind of start slowly, slowly uh, pushing away from my family. But I think more of the restorative work that, that I've had to deal with, uh, especially about my culture, happened just in the past couple of years um, when my birth mother, she passed away. And so she passed away in 2017. And so that was when I was able to kind of that was my first time going back um, to LA, kind of interacting with these like 12 church members that I hadn't seen in years, having frank conversations with my birth father about like how I was really upset and disappointed in the fact that he saw all of the abuse that was happening in the house, uh, but he was, uh, he was not strong enough to stop it. In fact, he, said something to me right after the funeral, we were driving back to the house and he said, David, um, and, and my Korean had gotten so bad at that point that I know he said a lot more, but I just couldn't pick up as much. But you know, he was, he said, David, I'm really, really sorry uh, about what happened to you. And I was like, where's this coming from? Like, I wasn't even, I was prepared to talk to him about it, but much later. And I was like, uh, what do you mean? And he goes, you know, after, 
after I left uh, for college, uh, essentially he, he became the next like victim, and and he was getting he was the main person getting um, all of that abuse from my birth mother, and he was saying like you know he tried to commit suicide twice because of it, and and so like I just like turned to him and I was like imagine being a child and going through that type of trauma, knowing that he went through the exact same thing that I did made me like kind of much more empathetic to him in a way. And so like that was also a process I had to go through. And then I also wanted to make sure that uh, he knew I was gay. Never in a million years did I think like he'd be okay with me being gay. My sisters had already told him like many, many years prior to that. But I, I told them uh, while I was there, I was like, dad, you need to understand that this is how God made me. And he goes, David, of course, that's how God made you. And we were in like, uh, I rented an Airbnb and we were in the jacuzzi. And I was just like, what? Like, did I hear that wrong? Like, holy crap. He just said that being gay is okay. And I was like, what, did, what the heck do you mean? <laughs> and, he, and again, like broken English, but essentially he said, this life that I live, it's so difficult being gay that like, of course, like who would choose, actively choose a life like that, especially in a Korean context. <laughs> I'm so grateful that that he was able to come around to that point because um, that was a big part of kind of my disconnection with my family, with my culture, like minus the abuse, like, it, it, you know, that was a l big part of kind of a lot of the issues that I had internally with them. So it was it was completely transformative. My name is David He Lee, and this is my Korean American story.